welcome everybody um, and welcome um, to people I don't know. Welcome to our um, other staff members and, and a special uh, shout out and welcome to some names I see here, people who were involved with the Neur Learning NAGPRA project in one uh, aspect or another. So I think what I'll just do is share my screen and just give you a little introduction to a project that was a, um, actually a six year long now project to address teaching and learning this. Can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, uh, the Learning Niagara project was indeed a long project, but one that <clears throat> that sought to deal with a particular problem in the way we teach and prepare people who work in uh, not just museums, but also in institutions um, of different kinds, and in particular also at universities who deal with collections. So this project uh, was a combined effort of uh, several co-PIs, the picture right here that you're looking at is a picture from our third collegium meeting, which took place in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I'll, I'll just point out the co-PIs and Pyburn in the first row, and then um, Jane Lee Thomas and Dr. Brian Gilley in the, the last row. We also had two extremely important collaborators who were uh, who are faculty members at the uh, Institute for American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, Jesse Riker Crawford and Felipe Colon. Uh, they consulted with us primarily because they had one of the oldest uh, and best developed repatriation and museum studies programs uh, for indigenous students in the country. Uh, I want to welcome also here today Angela Neller, who you see in the front row here. Um, The project addressed a problem in that we felt that training for people who could actually do the work of NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, um, were not all that, there was not all that much training to get people who could actually work within that um, program and to handle the work of repatriating Native American ancestral remains, as well as funerary objects, objects of cultural patrimony and sacred objects uh, to tribes. So we did a couple of different things in order to make uh, that work. First of all, we, ha we hired a spectacular postdoc, uh, Dr. Teresa Nichols, uh, who now works uh, for the uh, uh, Henry Lou School of Global and International Studies here at here at IU to um, <clears throat> handle a lot of the, the organization for the research. We started <clears throat> with doing surveys of both students and educators to find out how they learned about NAGPRA, how they learned about uh, working within the framework of NAGPRA to affect repatriations, how to approach consultation with Native American uh, federally recognized tribes in order, order to make repatriation happen, how to appropriately do and file inventories and inventories, notices of inventory completion, and so on. We also pulled together what we called collegia. Um, these were large meetings. We held three of them in three consecutive years. And those brought together about uh, 20 or so people together. The first two were held in Bloomington, the third one in Santa Fe, so that we could um, involve additional indigenous people in helping us figure out what was going wrong with uh, pedagogy, what we could do to improve pedagogy, 
and how we could build a network of people who were interested particularly in training people or helping people learn um, as we as we were learning ourselves about how to handle repatriation. One of the centerpieces of that project was to have graduate students join the, the collegiate meetings every year. So every year there were four to six graduate students who were part of the collegium. And actually some of those students who were there learning a little bit about um, repatriation in the collegium meetings also ended up actually going on to get their PhDs or to work in repatriation professionally. So that's, um, that's one thing that we're really happy to have seen. Throughout the entire project, probably about 75 uh, different collaborators, students, and um, people from different institutions, from different museums, worked together to, um, to not just do the work that the collegium was doing, but also to participate in the various aspects of the study. We did, in addition to surveys, we did a survey of um, professional archeologists in the Register for Professional Archeologists. We also ran a teaching study. And so there were faculty members at both tribal serving and non-tribal serving institutions who provided some interventions in their classrooms to introduce um, more NAGPRA related and repatriation related content. Over the years of the project, we settled on specific areas to work on. And those are what you see um, in the top, in the, the top bar here of the Learning NAGPRA website. So in learning, worldviews, uh, being able to, to sort of articulate indigenous worldviews and how those come up against some very westernized scientific worldviews uh, is was one of the, the sections and uh, Dr. Brian Gilley was essentially in charge of that one uh, for learning contexts in which NAGPRA applies. Uh, Dr. Pyburn worked uh, with Angela Neller and uh, Jesse Recker Crawford on that one. We had case studies, um, Jane Lee Thomas, um, um, our pedagogy expert, Jennifer Robinson from the anthropology department here at IU, and Felipe Colon were working on that one. Uh, we also enlisted the, the um, expertise of uh, Catherine or Katie Kearns, who's an instructional consultant. So we had people on the pedagogy end of it, we had people on the museum end of it, and we had people uh, on the teaching end of it to prepare what we ended up what we ended up coming up with. We also did some training session sections for people who our professional archaeologists, um, I headed that up. Teresa Nichols was a big part of that um, project. And also um, Carrie Sage Bill and Patricia Paulus were working on those. So the people you see here were a part of the project for um, all the, the years of the project, and their work is in evidence um, as we look at one of these contexts. So learning contexts. We have a website that lists um, course content that you can use that or that faculty or um, learners can use. And so we had um, 
different contributors pull together uh, work that would fit into these uh, different contexts. Both learning worldviews and learning contexts are actually um, able to serve to some extent as course outlines if anyone wanted to use those. In the case studies sections, we have introduction to, to case studies in general, and then we have individual case studies. One of our contributors to case studies was Anna Monty, who I see is here today. Uh, welcome, Anna, it's nice to see you. Here's a case study that, um, that covers the repatriation of an individ individual to Hawaii. And then finally, here we have a, um, a webinar that we recorded for people back, I think it was in 1917, I guess. Um, and that is available here for people to watch. We also developed um, a course through IU Expand, which is a, a platform on, can on Canvas that allows you to do a sort of self-paced uh, training. We, for that, for that one, we enlisted the help of a number of different individuals, including a couple of uh, forest, uh, National Forest uh, Service archeologists, including Angie Doyle, who I saw here today. So thank you for that, Angie. In general, the project information uh, is found on the last tab, if you're more interested, the ways we collected data, and the ways in which we shared the data um, that we collected. We did a lot of presentations, uh, posters at national meetings. We had discussions and discussion forums at national meetings, including uh, many other people that you're not seeing um, here directly on the, um, on the website, but also people who um, have worked in repatriation, have written about repatriation and have been um, movers and shakers in getting uh, repatriation uh, a much more active part of museum and university programs than it certainly was 15 or so years ago. And I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. I know this was a quick overview of what the project was. I was going to say, April, you've done a, a beautiful job of kind of summarizing learning NAGPRA for us. Um, we definitely have time for some questions. If people would like to put those in the chat, I can kind of um, communicate those and help um, however I can. But to kick things off, April, I was wondering, could you speak a little bit about the process that you guys used to kind of narrow down the learning contexts that you decided to include here? That's a great question. During our first collegian meeting, um, we cast a net pretty broadly and widely um, to include people who could maybe help us figure out where we needed to focus. And so in our first collegiate meeting, we threw out all kinds of ideas. Uh, ideas having to do with, with language, ideas having to do with maybe making a video game. Um, since none of us had that expertise, fortunately, we did not choose to go that direction. Uh, and as we did that, uh, we learned a lot more about the people who had come to that uh, original meeting 
And then we had a, a, a sort of a, a think tank meeting in which um, the, the PIs met with um, Jesse Riker Crawford and Felipe Colon in Arizona. And we spent some days together just hashing it out. We were at the Ameren Foundation. Um, a shout out to them for supplying that venue for us to, for us to use. And we narrowed it down at that point in looking at worldviews, um, then the context in which NANGFRA applies, what, is, what does it do and when, how do you, how do you use it to address um, major issues in um, indigenous um, um, survivance and dealing with historical trauma and, and how repatriation can be one of those, one of those ways um, to, um, to promote resilience. We also decided at that point to do something for uh, CRM archeologists, for people who work in preservation and, um, and generally deal with one of the, one of this, um, the provisions of NAGPRA, which is that you have to have a plan for what you're going to do if there is an inter inadvertent discovery of human remains or funerary objects on federal or tribal land. Um, and it was in that area that our, our uh, friends in the, in the National Forest were particularly helpful. Thank you. There is another question here. Um, and it is, are there special methodologies when working and collecting information with different tribes and indigenous groups in consideration of their worldviews and cultural practices? Um, I think in, in I think um, perhaps uh, Jalen Thomas might be better at answering this question because she's the one who handles most of the consultation at IU for NAGPRA. But it's important to know about a tribe if you're going to talk to them. Um, something about the history of the tribe, the governance of the tribe, being able to, to meet with people, understand that these are sovereign nations that we're dealing with, not just groups of people. And to always have that idea that when you're working with a sovereign nation, that's pretty special. So I think we found pretty often that um, in doing consultations, tribes will be very upfront about what they need. Thank you. And I think this last question is the perfect one to end on. Um, so it reads, thanks April. Is this website part of the curriculum in anthropology or Native American studies at IU? How is what you learned shared more broadly? Um, it is not yet part of the curriculum, but it can be used as part of the curriculum. We are still finishing up some of the details on the website. It turns out to, that pulling all this information together, um, especially when you have over 40 contributors, it takes a little bit of time, but it would be great if it could be become part of the curriculum. As a person who is retiring, I would love to see it used. Uh, we will be maintaining the website for at least five years. Um, so hopefully, yes, it could become part of the curriculum. It could become part of um, an online curriculum that I know that IU wants to develop. That's fantastic. And I know I said that was the last question, but one more just came in that I'm not going to specifically ask. Um, but I'm going to kind of reframe it here. What should somebody do or where should somebody go if they'd like to learn more about protocols and the rules and regulations of NAGPRA? Uh, one of the easiest places to go to learn um, a lot about NAGPRA is the learning, is, is the, um, the National NAGPRA website because they have a lot of links to uh, I should probably have this somewhere here. Um, uh, they have a lot of links to different videos and questions and answers and um, basic 
training for working uh, with the federally recognized tribes uh, on repatriation. That's a great place to start. Thank you. Well, everyone, we have probably filled up your coffee break. So thank you very, very much for joining us. Um, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season and new year, and we will start conducting more coffee and curator talks in January when um, actually I will be talking about the Minton collection. So until then, have a wonderful rest of your week. And thanks to everybody who, who showed up. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much.